Hello, my name is Robin Hollander. Um, I'm a compositor with Better Digital out in New Zealand at, uh, in beautiful Wellington. It's sun and rain today, so if you've ever been here, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I want to give you a, a quick introduction to some really cool new tools that you're going to have in Nuke 6.3, and it's the support for deep opacity file formats, and which allows us to do some uh, deep compositing, I guess, as we call it. Now, a lot has been said over deep, uh, deep opacity and deep compositing in the past, but I think it's it's mainly been related to maybe more all CG shots and how it benefits that. So I want to try and give you a bit of a, a look into how we use deep opacity to do our 2D and plate-based shots because it's it's really changed the way that we do things around here and uh, it's it's really great. So in a nutshell, what deep opacity is, it's um it's the ability to store multiple values per pixel. So for someone like me, who's not all that technical, I like to think of it as a, you know, a really fancy, de a fancy depth channel, and I'll show you a bit about that today and how it works. Now, like I said before, traditionally, um, deep opacity is maybe more at home with all CG movies. The reason for that being is it, it's very easy to run out a whole sequence of animated characters and you know complex scenes and jungles and mountains and stuff like that and it allows us to do all the holdouts for these individual elements within uh, Nuke. So obviously that saves us a lot of time if if a jungle layout is being changed, if uh, you know updates to certain animation types, you don't have to rerun all the holdouts but just individual elements and it allows us to then update that all in Nuke. Now like I said it is more of a sort of an all CG thing in a lot of people's minds but we actually found that it works incredibly well with 2D based shots and obviously that's when Nuke is really king is you know your traditional plate based compositing. So um, one of the shots that I'd like to show you on is from the new movie at the moment Rise of the Planet of the Apes which we've just completed yesterday actually. Uh, very excited it was an a tremendous task and we went through a lot of shots uh, every single shot would have had deep compositing done in Nuke to it. Um, this shot here so uh, you can see Caesar, the main monkey, who's leading the charge. I'm not giving away too much here, but this is a shot you would have maybe seen in the trailer. So as you can see, I'll just stop on one of the frames at the end. Um, they're on the bridge. It's a CG bridge, but the plate, all the cars, um, is yeah, like I said, it's a plate. It's a 2D extension for the cars as well. But the bridge is CG. All the monkeys are CG. And as you can see, there's there's quite a few of them. So there's not just one or two passes, but I think there was about 60 odd passes in this shot. So if we would have to run them all out with, like I said, holdouts through Maya, and if anything would have changed, animation left, right and centre, it would have been a bit tedious to go and rerun them all. And we also wanted to be able to just swap individual monkeys, you know, if you wanted to get loose some, if you wanted to grade some differently. It was really nice to have them as individual passes, and uh, deep compositing gave us the ability to do that. So. Um, I'll just show you. I, I set up a real basic script in order to kind of demonstrate this. Obviously, it's a little bit more complex than what I was going to show you right now. So, as you can see, this is the plate here. There we had a lovely green screen uh, shot in Vancouver, and it had a lot of cars. Now, all of these cars, obviously, if you want to have monkeys run through them, you have to rotoscope them, you have to track them, you have to do all of that. But allowing us to do all these holdouts. In, in Nuke, rather than just doing it old school compositing way where you have a rotor shape per car and you have to, you know, if a monkey's in front of it, you turn the rotor shape off, if it's behind it, you turn it on. It gets a little bit tedious if you have 60 monkeys and you have to do that. So deep compositing was really great. So if I just look at this comp real quick, so I've got my green screen here, I pulled a real quick key and I just layered it over the background. So you can see we've got a matte painting sky background, it's got a bay of San Francisco there. And it's also got a CG bridge extension at the back. Like I said, this is very, very basic setup. The, you know, it's a few nodes thrown together. But if I look what makes this image up so far without the monkeys, like I said, we've got our plates, we've got our matte painting here, and then we also had the CG uh, bridge, which we split out into a few elements. So we've got the main bridge here, and then, for instance, we've got the cables here. Now the cables in this case we ran out of 4K, so we get really nice anti-aliasing, so I had to reformat that later on. I'll talk about that in a second. But as you can see, the way we render our images, we've got a normal EXR image, it's got RGBA data, and then on top of that, 
we run out a deep opacity pass. Now the deep opacity pass we really use for the deep data, which like I said is basically lovely depth and an alpha channel. If I just look at the EXR image here, you will see down here that like I said, the only channels that you'll have is RGBA. Now if you look at the deep file over here, you can see it's nice and black and white. It's got an alpha channel, it's all good. But in addition to RGBA, it's got depth and deep. Now what does deep data look like? Uh, I can show you. I can set my alpha channel to be deep. And if I look at my alpha channel here, you see you don't see very much. And the reason for that is that the values in deep are so incredibly large, they don't just go from 0 to 1 like your typical alpha channel. So in order to actually see anything, I'm going to stop this all the way down. And all of a sudden, you can see what looks like a depth channel. If I change these values a little bit, you can see the build-up of it. So, like I said, every pixel in this RGBA beauty pass would have the corresponding depth to it, and the pixel behind it, and so forth, and so forth. So it's pretty neat. You can see the whole range of, of the data that's stored in that deep file. So we've got two passes now. I'll just switch this back to RGBA. We've got our two passes. We've got bridge and we've got deep. Now, in order to do deep compositing, we have to add those two passes together. Now, you will notice in Nuke 6.3, there's a new menu called deep. Um, I hope you don't find this too confusing. I get really lost in all the icons, so I always use this drop-down menu. But you'll see a menu here called deep. And I'm going to give you a, br a brief introduction to a few of uh, the notes that we see here. The most basic out of all of them is to load deep in is the deep read node. It works exactly the same way as any read node that you've seen before, but it's specifically for deep data. So because I've already prepared this script, I'm going to cancel this. But I've already got this deep data here. So now we need to go to the next step. How do we combine deep data with RGBA data? Again, this is very simple. You go to the deep menu, and you'll find this little node here, deep read color. Now, deep read color has got two inputs, color and depth. Color would be your EXR render, which has RGBA data in it. Just pass this. And depth would be your deep opacity file. So that's exactly what I did here. This deep read color, you can see color here going to my EXR image, and depth going to my deep image, which is the deep opacity file for this bridge. If I look at this image now, well, it looks exactly the same, but you'll notice down here that the channels have gone from just RGBA to RGBA, depth, and deep. Now, this is where it starts getting really fun. So I did the same thing for my bridge cables over here. You can see the bridge cables here and the bridge here. Now, if I look at this visually, the bridge itself, you could do a straight over because obviously the cables are on the side of the bridge. They go over that. This is quite a simple example, but once you have two streams of deep images, this here and this here, you can combine them. Now, you don't need to combine them using something like an over because that's where deep is really cool. It figures out which pixel is in front of the other pixel and it merges them accordingly. Again, if I go into the deep node, uh, deep menu, sorry, there's a node here, deep merge, and it's very simple. It literally has two inputs, one input here and an other input here. Like other merge nodes, as soon as you connect the second one, you can have more and more and more. So it allows you to really just add in all your deep data in one simple merge node if you want to. So I already prepared one here. If I look at this, you'll see that the cables and the bridge were composited together exactly the way they should be. It doesn't matter the order of these. So if I switch these around, you know, one and two or two and one, it doesn't matter because it is depth based. So it will just analyze a pixel, look where it is in the depth and then merge the two together accordingly. So, now that I have both of these passes uh, combined together with RGB and depth data, if I want to add this back over, in this case my sky matte painting, you'd think, okay, well I'll just add an over node and add these two together. Now that's where you just have to tell Deep to turn itself back into an image. So what we got here, and it's this color coded in these nodes, this is now a deep stream. To add this back to normal RGBA images, you select the deep merge node. Again, in the deep menu, select deep to image. It does exactly that. So you look at this now. 
The output from the deep merge and the deep to image looks exactly identical, but you will notice here in the nodes you will now have your RGBA channels. And if I now add this back over, there you go, that's our basic comp of the bridge that's being merged together with the deep data added over the background. So this is a very simple example, and I think this is where all CG shots traditionally would, you know, would be a, maybe a better example, but in my case not quite as interesting. Um, obviously, if you have a, a big scene with cars going behind each other and you know lots of stuff happening, and it's all CG, all deep data, you can literally load in all your files, connect them all to one deep merge node, do a deep to image, and everything will be stacked up exactly the way it should be. Now, like I said. Uh, be quite a boring demonstration if I just show you that, so I want to show you how it actually works with the plate. So we've got a green screen plate over here, do a quick over, and you can see that's already half the shot there. You know, joking, obviously there's a lot still missing, but that's kind of your A over B, want to have a background prepared with all the bridge. Now the next step obviously in this shot, if I just go back to this uh, clip here, is the monkeys. I mean it is called Rise of the Planet of the Apes and not look at all the cars on the bridge. So I think we should uh, start adding some monkeys in here. Now, as I mentioned before, the monkeys are actually, or apes, I'm sorry, I keep mixing them up. Um, the apes, obviously, all individual passes, there's about 60 of them, so quite tedious to try and do it all individually. We've got our main hero character, Caesar. He's like that. Oops. So same thing again, if I look at him here, you can see he's just got RGBA data. I look at his deep opacity file, that's got depth and deep. I add the two together, and now all of a sudden we've got RGBA, depth and deep. Now I grouped all my monkeys into a little group here. So you can see I can treat this as one, uh, as one pass, which is quite cool. But if I have a look what's inside of this group, I open the parameters for that. I'll just click on the show contents uh, tab here. You can see, I wasn't lying, there's a lot of monkeys, a lot of individual passes. Each one of these passes, you can see, came in as an EXR. Uh, we've got a little Python script that just lets us import lots of little files and it groups them together and adds them all together. So you can see it comes in as an EXR and it's got a deep read node with the corresponding deep data. And then using the depth, uh, deep read color, it adds deep and, depth data, uh, sorry, deep and RGBA data together and then at the end we merge it all together. So if you look at it, there is a lot of monkeys. <laughs> and it's cool, it all goes into one deep merge node. If you look at the output of that, that's your monkeys right here. So you see from a sort of a, um, how would I say, from, a, from an organization point of view in your com script, this is actually really nice, you know, it, it lets you group stuff like that together and you know that there's no holdouts applied to these monkeys. I mean, they're all holding out each other. You can see this orangutan here is in front of all these other monkeys back here. And again, the order that these elements go into the merge node is completely irrelevant because it's depth-based and it will just add them together accordingly. So this is really nice. I now know, if I go back to my main comp, that this group here is image data and deep data. So I can now use this and I can hold it out against whatever I needed to hold out. It's, it's like one element and I can just put it in space and I can add in little blockers in between. So I'll show you real quick what I mean. If I want to combine Caesar here, our hero monkey, with these guys, like I showed you earlier, I'll go back into the deep menu, I'll add another deep merge node, and look at that. So now they're all together, and again, they've got RGBA and depth data. Now, like I said earlier, deep is really cool because it, it lets you keep multiple samples per pixel. And I think a really nice way to demonstrate that is to do a crop. And I'm not just talking about an image-based crop, but it's a depth-based crop. So again, I select my deep merge node. I go to the deep menu, and I select deep crop. Now, by default, you can see that it's actually using Z near, Z far, and a bounding box crop. If I turn all of these off, the result is as it came in. It's you know nothing's changed. If I just turn on, say, the bounding box crop, you will see that it will just crop your image. This works exactly the same way as a normal 2D image crop, 
this will just crop your deep data. This is not what I want in this case because I want to show you the multiple samples per pixel gadget, which I think is really cool. So there's a few ways of doing it. You could say, you know, I want to clip it in the near plane or I want to clip it in the far plane, or crop it as they call it here. So if I say clip it near, say use, well, nothing's happened. How come? Well, Z near is set to 1. You know, that's that's at camera level, that's at the lens, so we're cropping it there, that's great, so we're not going to lose anything. If I switch back from RGB alpha to deep front, I can now go in and scrub values. So you can see if I'm scrubbing Caesar's eyes, you will see down here in the color picker, that's uh, 336 units. So in my case, that would be 3.5 meters from camera, roughly. So if I want to say, okay, I actually don't want to have Caesar in this shot anymore, I want to clip him out, but I want to keep everything behind him, I'll just say, okay, he's at 336, 350, okay, I'll just say I'll be safe and I'll crop him at 500. Okay, so now Caesar's gone. That's all cool. So if you want to get rid of this monkey as well, he's at 922. Okay, so we'll say we'll clip it at 1,000 and he's gone. Now what you can see is obviously there are monkeys behind the orangutan and you're kind of going well hang on I just said that there's multiple samples per pixel but the monkey's disappeared, where's he gone, you know all the monkeys behind him uh, I think he's lying. Well the reason that's happening is if I go back into my group and if I zoom in onto my merge node and just bring up the parameters for that you will see that drop hidden samples is turned on. Now Obviously, quite often, you will not want to get rid of a monkey like that, but still see something behind him, because if you're going to punch a hole, you know, if he's not visible, because there's a tree in front of him, the monkeys behind him aren't going to be visible either. So drop hidden samples is just a way of speeding things up. It's literally dropping samples it's not going to see. But in this case, because I want to show you that a sample does store multiple values, I'm going to turn this back, or turn it off, and you can suddenly see that all the monkeys are appearing back here. If I go back to my main comp, and I'll look at my crop again, I can just keep increasing this value and basically just getting rid of rows and rows and rows of monkeys. This is obviously an incredibly cool feature if you need to base some image or if you need to treat monkeys at certain depth differently, you know, if you have monkeys coming out of a ray of light or something like that and you want to isolate them or, you know, or have a 2D element in the middle like fire or something like that, you know, you can crop them, say like everything behind 30 meters is one element and everything in front of 30 meters is another element. And that's what I mean about organization's um, abilities as well. So because this is one group, but I have all this flexibility to change stuff around, it's incredibly powerful for a, you know, for a compositor. Now if I turn this back off, obviously you have Z near, you also have Z far, it does exactly the same thing, but it goes from the back. So this defaults to two, now everything behind two is going to be cropped, it's not what we want, if I say, you know, 3000 for instance. Exactly the same way like we did it before, it's just going the other direction. So if I just want to isolate Caesar, I know that he was around 500, I think, something like that. So if I say crop him at 600, there you go, We've just managed to isolate our hero monkey. And it's, uh, it's pretty neat being able to have that ability, it, it really helps a lot. Okay, so that in a nutshell, I think, is, is how the deep opacity data works. How I said it's the multiple values per pixel. But now we'll go on and we'll do some more crazy stuff. So if I look at this again, like I told you before with the bridge over here, in order for me to put those monkeys over the plate, I obviously need to add a merge node. I'll just add one here. And the monkeys to be A. I can't connect them, obviously, because they're still in deep land. So what I need to do is select this, do not a deep to image. And there you go. The monkeys are now turned back from deep data into RGBA data. And I can stick that back over my comp, over my plates. And it's actually not going to look all that exciting because at the moment there's no holdouts whatsoever. The monkeys are just going to go straight A over B. But bear in mind that these are literally about 60 individual passes that we just kind of kludge together in a minute in their correct order and everything, put them back over the top. So I think that's pretty cool that you can do that.
Now, I want to start introducing a couple of holdouts, so I think the easiest way for me to do that is by just turning off Caesar's merge here, so we can actually see stuff behind him, because him being the leader, he kind of covers the whole shot a bit, which uh, for the holdout purpose that I want to show you now is not ideal. Great, now so obviously in a shot like this, um, like I showed you before, the, the plates, there's an incredible amount of cars, and uh, eventually you will have to rotoscope them all. Hopefully you'll have a, a very talented rotoscoping department like we do, and they'll do the brunt of the work for you, and you know, hats off to those guys. A shot like this, it's it's very, very tedious. I'll show you again, these are all the, all the different cars that we had. So there's a couple of ways of, of going about it. I took the liberty, I prepared a little roto shape here, and I put it on a card 3D node that uh, is linked to a camera. All the translate and rotate values are basically exactly the same as the camera on the frame that I'm working on. It's uh, another little gizmo that we have that just kind of copies all those values in there and it puts it at a scale of uh, a thousand units, so that in our case would be 10 meters. So. That's our shape here. Let's say I want to hold out this gorilla and this chimp, and basically anything that's behind this car needs to be held out. Now, the easiest way to do this, the easiest way to do this is write a shape on a card. This will output depth for me, and this RGB data from the writer shape and the depth data from the card we can turn to deep data and use as a holdout. It's pretty neat. The way to do that is you select the card 3D, we go back into the deep mode, uh, deep menu, sorry, and we'll say deep to image. Ah, sorry, got me all confused there. Obviously, that's not deep, it's an image, so you want to say deep from image. They sound so similar. <laughs> now, there's a few options here. You can pre multiply your input and you can also specify Z. Now, because this is obviously a card 3D, we already have the depth, uh, the depth specified. At the moment, you can see in the scale here, it's at 1000. So if I say deep from image, look at that, it's just a card. But again, because I'm in deep mode up here, deep front, you will see the alpha channel readout, that's the depth of it. If I now want to use this to hold out my monkeys here, that's them right here. Select a group. I go back into my deep menu, and instead of a deep merge like before, I'll say deep holdout. Oops. Now, one thing that's different than a deep merge node is the deep holdout. It takes two inputs, and they're both deep. So we've got my main monkeys input here, that's deep data, and then I've got my rotor shape that I turn to deep data. That's going to be my holdout. What this does, unlike a merge node, like I said, it takes two deep inputs, but it actually outputs RGBA data. Thinking is that you, you, know, you combine all your holdouts into one, you do one holdout, and that's then going to be your final image. So if I look at this here, you can see that the monkey here was being held out in exactly the right depth you know, and everything. If I get a readout on the monkey, you can see the monkey's like 1,480 units roughly. And uh, remember, in my card 3D, I set this, the depth of it to be a 1,000. And also, if I get a readout on the card, you can see it's just around 1,000. So obviously, anything that's behind this is going to be held out by it. Anything that's in front of it is not going to be held out. Now, if I want to show you exactly how that works, if I take this card 3D and say, OK, the scale, make it 2,000. We'll just let this update real quick. You can now see, well, the gorilla's obviously back in front of it because he's not that deep. He's only at 1,400, and I'm setting the card at 2,000. However, you can see there's this little bug uh, bugger back here. He's obviously way deeper. He's at, uh, if you look down here in the color values, he's at 2,200. So he's being held out, but not the gorilla. And so that's incredibly cool. So once I have rotor and I know it's at the correct depth, you know, I'll do it once and then the animation on the monkeys can change 10 times, and I know in 90% of the cases they, they're just going to be held out exactly the way they should be. If I set this back to 1000, see like that. Now, another, another way you can do this in Deep From Image, you can specify Z. 
So I could say, okay, at the moment it's set at zero. That's probably not so good. If I just want to do a really broad garbage mat, I know I want a writer shape that's just going to hold out everything. Um, I'll just get rid of this card. I'll get rid of this writer shape. I'll make a new one. Let's say for some crazy reason I needed a holdout in in this shape here. I could just say deep from image, select it, say specify Z, <clears throat> and I could select a super low value, for instance one. If I look at this now, just zoom back in. Sorry, my, my pen gets a bit stuck. <laughs> There you go. So this is a really great way if you know if you really want to get rid of something and it's not really depth dependent anymore, you just want to kill an area. You can just draw a big square or whatever and do a deep from image and set it to one or two or whatever, but one's quite a safe value and it will just punch a hole into everything. Now obviously you could just specify this a little further. Again I could say one thousand, for instance. Or it's even cooler. The gorilla obviously has his um, hands stretched out. So if I look at the value here, the hands at fourteen seventy four, and his belly is at fifteen forty. So if I set this holdout to be fifteen hundred, you'll see that the gorilla's hand is in front of it. And, you know his his mouth is coming through slowly. As I push this back, you will reveal more and more of the gorilla. So I push this back another 10 units, and another 10 units, and another 10 units. So this is, a, for a compositor, this is incredible, because again, let's, let's assume he's coming through a wall of fog. You know, everything behind the fog I want to have really milky and diffused, but everything that's coming out of it might also need a, some fire treatment or something like that. So being able to put a card or a rotor in at a certain depth and just say, right, hold out everything behind that, and then, you know, I can treat that differently if I like. That's a pretty, pretty cool feature to have. Um, another really useful tool is if you have something set at a certain depth, but you need to change the depth ever so slightly, I could then go to the Deep Transform node, which obviously lets me allow, allows me to move deep data around. Now, any Anything you want to do to deep data has to come from this deep menu here, so you can't apply filters or transforms to it. But there is a deep transform for exactly that reason. Now obviously this has got X, Y, and Z. If I want to change the depth of something, I can just shift it around in Z. So if I want to bring it back 10 units, I just say depth uh, Z minus 10. And you can see I'm shifting this plane back forwards again. You really have to think about this in a 3D kind of way, even though this is obviously in 2D mode. But I can just shift it around. So that's 20 units back. So this is a really nice way of just fine-tuning animation. You can obviously keyframe this and, you know, over the course of your shot, you can go in and change all of that. Now, another really, really cool thing is, um, like I said, obviously, if I look at my plate here, we had our rotor department, roto, all of these cars. If I look at one of the rotors that did, this lovely maroon Chevy at the front here, now, I've already got rotor for that. It's not on a card, so there's no depth for it. So I need to find a way of putting this back into, into the proper depth space and turning that into deep. And there's some really, really neat features of doing that. Obviously, I could just look at my monkeys, and I know that Maurice, the name of this orangutan here, he's going to be climbing up over this monkey. I could just look at the deep data and get a readout and say, OK, well, he's at 960-something. I could put a card in, you know, that's all good. But I think what's a lot cooler is this node here. It's called Deep to Points. Um, I already did one because it takes a little bit of time to calculate it, but it has two inputs, your deep input and your camera input. Uh, you connect those two and you look at it, but it basically looks at your camera information and it looks at the deep information and it plots out your whole scene in deep data in the, in the 3D viewer and it, it lets you select points and you can add cards so once it's loaded up into the 3D view I can show you exactly. It's an incredible useful way of you know adding foot contacts or if you need to have little elements like you know maybe they're running through a jungle and they need to kick up leaves 
you can go in into this 3D view and see exactly where their, their feet are touching and go and add elements and cards and make sure they're in the right depth and you know. So here we are, this is now in the 3D space. If I hit F to see what's going on, you can see there's my camera. If I zoom in a bit. You can see these are all my monkeys in 3D space. Now the way obviously it does that, it has per pixel it has RGBA data and it has the depth data, so it just maps that into space. It's a really, really cool way, I think, of visualizing your scene, actually seeing what's going on, and being able to add, like I said, cards at certain points. You know, let's assume these two orangutans here, they I don't know, they set off an explosion or you know, an explosion of bananas or whatever. So you could add in a card in 3D space at this depth here and add an exploding banana element to it. We didn't actually have any exploding bananas in this movie, which I thought was a bit of a shame, but maybe uh, maybe a movie you'll work on at some point has that. So now what's really cool, if I look through my camera here, that's my scene right here, I want to be able to snap a card to the depth of, of this monkey here. Like I said before, we've got Roto for the card that he's going to climb over, but I need to find out exactly where in space he is. So if I go up here to the Snap menu, and I say Vertex Selection, you can see that they all turn into a big, uh, big cluster of points. If I just select a few here, uh, I'll go back out of my 3D view, and I want to add a new card because I'm going to put this through a scanline render. I've got my card here, and in the Card Snap menu, I just say Match select, uh, Selection Position. So this is going to create a card that's going to match these points here. To see what's actually going on, I'm just going to add a scene node. I'm going to connect that to my deep two points. Now you can't see much, that's because the card is pretty small. If I make that a bit bigger, you can see that it's now actually added a card at pretty much where I needed to be. You know, I selected these points here, added a card. So this is incredibly useful, I find, for adding in cards for putting in elements and at the correct depth, you know, you want to make sure that they the holdouts do the right thing, but also that way, you know, if there's if there's movement on it, on the camera, I know that the parallax and everything is just going to work perfectly. So I can delete that again. This deep to points really is just for me to, to see what's going on. Uh, I don't actually have any direct use. I'm not going to plug it into a comp and get anything out of it. I'm just going to create this card in the right space. So now if I add a scanline render node, and select my camera. Now obviously this is not putting anything because I'm not putting anything into the card. So the best way to go about it that I found is I add a constant node. And we set the channels to RGBA and we set our color to 1. Now obviously because this goes through a scanline render this outputs depth like the card 3D before, which is great. So if I now want to turn this to deep data, I can say deep from image. Again, we don't want to specify Z because it's already being generated by the scanline render. And if I now plug this into a holdout node over here for the monkeys, you can see it's 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 holding out all the monkeys. Now the reason for that obviously is, is it's a constant node on the card. It's covering the entire screen. Now the whole reason for this exercise obviously was to try and get depth from this rotor shape because I only want to apply that depth if you will to this to this um, car here. So a cool way of doing that is I've got my scanline render it's outputting RGBA in depth data. I'll just add a shuffle copy node. I've got this as my two input. Select my rotor, put that into the one input. And as you can see the rotor is in the red channel. So I go back to my shuffle copy. I've got image one goes in here and it goes out into image two over here. So it comes in red and I want it to go out as alpha. So if I look at this now, I select the alpha channel up here, I look at my alpha channel, my constant node that has all the correct depth and deep data once it's been deepified if you will down here, has now got uh, the alpha for the car. So if I look at the deep holdout over here, you can see I've now got a holdout that's working just for this car here and once I put them back over the plate you'll see exactly that it's doing the right thing. But it's, it's not affecting any areas over here that it would have chopped off before without the shuffle mode. And again, like I mentioned before, deep holdout outputs non-deep data. So I can just select my overnode connected to this here and look at it. And you can now see 
this monkey here is not perfectly hold out against the car. Uh, you might have to shuffle the depth around a bit, push it backwards and forwards, and that's where you can use the deep transform. Now, obviously, at the moment, I'm just using one simple rotor shape, so all the other monkeys aren't being held out. Like I said, there's there's a lot of cars here, so to make uh, my life a bit easier, I pre-comped out rotor shapes for all of these um, cars and, and rendered them out as deep. So if I select this node, I can look at it here. This is my cars here. It's got an alpha channel. I also had, a, had to add a little railing. If I go back to my clip, you can see this monkey back here. He's running behind that railing, so I had to do a little bit of rotor for that area back here. If I turn to deep data for this here, stop it way down, you can see there's rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of cars. So this obviously looks cool like that, but you want to see what it does when it goes into the holdout. So we've got our apes here, we've got our deep holdout here, which is using all the rotor that I did and assembled from our rotor department for this shot. Um, I put them all onto cards, so like I showed you in those two techniques, I just made sure that they're all at the, the correct depth. There you go, it doesn't look like that much, but as soon as I put it over the plate, you can see all the all the monkeys are in their correct spaces, you know, they're behind cars where they have to be, they're in front cars where they have to be. One thing it doesn't do, obviously, because the rotors, uh, scopers didn't do that on our request, is the wind uh, windscreens. Because there's going to be so much different treatment, like reflections and stuff like that, added back onto them, uh, we didn't bother with rotoscoping those. But in terms of, you know, where he needs to go, you can see his arms and his hand that are in front of the car, right in the right space. Everything that's behind it is being held out. Uh, if I go back to my clip, you can really see that, you know, in areas like this over here, they're coming out from behind the cars where they have to. And they're jumping back over. We could obviously then add a bit of treatment for the windscreens back here. So really, in a nutshell, you know, doing a shot like this without the ability to um, use deep compositing, I think, would have been an absolute nightmare. And like that, it was actually, you know, a, a, quite a breeze to do. It was quite, quite nice and easy. Um, obviously, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What you can do with deep. Unfortunately, the, this is the end of the video for me. Um, but I, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Like I said, this, you know, very, very basic introduction of the concept behind deep compositing. And like I said earlier, it's. I think for 2D compositing, it's so amazing. You know, if you, it's a, little, a slightly different change. You have to kind of think about setting up your whole shot in in depth. You know, so if you have a plate, you need to make sure that you can generate depth for everything in your shot. But bear in mind, I've now got depth for all the cars and the bridge and all the monkeys. So if I want to add anything like a big fog volume over everything, there's no problem because I can just bang that in there and it's going to hold itself out. Where it has to, I can dial it backwards and forwards, I can recline it more into depth, I can, you know, brighten areas in depth. The possibilities are really, really huge. Um, so yeah, hopefully this, this video gave you a little bit of inspiration and go out and try it. I think it's really, really cool. All right, thank you very much and have a nice day.